muted. Frankie uh, muted. What's up, my friends in the film panda? Now that I found the mute button, apparently. Uh, wherever you may be and however you may be watching, thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. Uh, yeah, now that you guys can hear me. Uh, so the Snyderverse is officially wrapped up. The DCEU, as it was envisioned with Ben Affleck and Henry Cavill, it has now all seen the big screen. We've had a chance to go over all these movies over the course of the last 10 or so years and kind of take stock of what they were. But there's one more movie we still have to talk about. That, of course, is Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Joining me to talk about the film it is The Shape of the Star State. My man, Tex, what's up? Uh, I'm, I'm here. Sorry for my absence the last few, you know, week and a half or so. I'm a little under the weather in a physical way. But, you know, I love the Snyder verse. And, I'm, you know, I needed to be here to discuss its final entry, so... One of those kind of things. Yeah, Jeremy not here tonight. He's doing some prep work for a convention that him and, and Tin Scepter are going to. So I'm sure there will be pictures to come from that as well. Follow him on Twitter. You'll be able to see uh you'll be able to see all the pictures and stuff that he does on con that they're going to. Uh so just me and text tonight. But it, it's it's good because I am a I like to say objective observer of the of the DCEU of the Snyderverse. Tex is more of a hardcore fan, much like American well, I am New Jersey, all but, deep into the cult, baby. But uh, I've got so, the tattoo and everything. So. Yeah, it, it's good to it's good to have the back and forth. I, I would really like to have somebody on here that just blatantly hates it <laughs> to kind of to kind of give the perfect balance. But I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll criticize it when uh, when I think it's necessary. But uh, yeah, we are obviously here to talk tonight about the final installment of the Snyder version. That is Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Uh, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is the 2023 American superhero film based on the DC Comics featuring the character of the same name. Produced by DC Studios uh, and the Safford Company. Distributed by Warner Brothers Pictures. It is a sequel to Aquaman, which came out in 2018. And the 15th and final film in the DC Extended Universe, the DCEU. The film was directed by James Wan from a screenplay written by David Leslie Johnson McCormick. That's a lot of names for one person. And stars Jason Momoa as Arthur Curry or Aquaman. Alongside Patrick Wilson, Amber Heard, uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, I always mispronounce his name, Randall Park, Dolph Lundgren, Tamira Morrison, Martin Short, and Nicole Kidman. In the film, Arthur must work with his half-brother Orm, played by Wilson, to prevent Black Manta, played by Mateen, from killing his family and using the cursed Black Trident to overheat the world while searching for the lost Seventh Kingdom of the Seas. Momo actually pitched the story for an Aquaman sequel during production of the first film. Juan did not want to rush to a sequel, but agreed in January of 2019 to oversee development. The writer signed on to return as a screenwriter a month later, and Juan was confirmed to be returning as the director in August of 2020. He said that the film would expand on Aquaman's world building, have a more serious tone, and feature themes such as climate change. It is a buddy cop movie of sorts between Aquaman and Orm, and was inspired by the Silver Age comic books with a retro science fiction vibe similar to the works of animator Ray Harryhausen and the horror films of the 60s, specifically Planet of the Vampires from 1965. Aquaman the Lost Kingdom premiered a fan event in uh, at, at the at the at the Grove Los Angeles in December 19th of 2023 and was released in the United States on December 22nd. The film received generally negative reviews from critics and grossed uh, 434 million dollars worldwide against a production budget of about 200 to 250 million. On uh, review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes, 34% of 203 critics reviews are positive with an average rating of 4.9 out of 10. The website's consensus reads, quote, Jason Momoa remains a capable and committed leading man, but even DC diehards may feel that Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom sticks to familiar waters. Uh, that's not a terrible uh, kind of consensus review, but it doesn't exactly say what a lot of people would want you to say about a movie like this, the big budget comic book fair that we've been getting for 15, 20 years now, going all the way back to you know, when Marvel started, really. Uh, to, to that the era of the superhero blockbuster mega mashup stuff that we've been getting since Marvel started. But uh, I don't know. Text, give me some of your quick thoughts on Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. Yeah, um, obviously the whole Amber Heard situation. I'm sure we can. I mean, hell, how many hours have we already talked about her with all this mess? But I was kind of sad going into this because it was the end of the Snyderverse. I mean, you know, the Snyderverse was, it's got my favorite Batman and Superman. And as much as I like Jason Momoa, he's he's not even the best. He's not he might be the third best thing in this film. I mean, there's there's some really good performances in here, and I had a blast with this one. I really enjoyed it. I, me and my youngest had went to see it, and it was um, 
it, 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 it was kind of a blow off film because obviously, you know, when this had came out, James Gunn had already announced this movie, the flash blue beetle. And, uh, I think Shazam two were the four DC films that didn't matter because a new universe was coming. So this is, I think that really contributed to the low box office. But I like this movie. It was a lot of fun. It's got its problems. And, you know, I, there's there's one thing I will heavily criticize later. But, uh, you know, overall, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm with you on the fact that this movie just kind of, in a vacuum, in and of itself, wasn't a bad movie overall. I mean, it is, uh, it's, uh, I, I think they made the best decision they could to separate this movie from the larger DCU that was exists on its own. No, no. And, and yeah, for a lot of reasons, you end up cutting out like the the two Batman cameos that were filmed, and you know you you don't have Gal Gadot, you don't have any connection to the larger DCU. Let this movie exist in and of itself. That was the best chance you could give this movie to make sure that it wasn't going to be held up to the crappy standards of what has been the rest of the DCEU at times. Let this movie kind of exist all on its own. That was the best possible decision they could have made for the movie. And I think it worked. I think it worked by and large. Because just by concentrating on what was happening in this part of the world, in the universe where this situation is happening, you were able to expand the story more, focus more on some good dialogue. I I enjoyed the villain. I mean, he's not quite Thanos level, but I mean, like I said, the superhero is only as good as the villain. So he's, there's a solid villain, solid actor in this playing the villain. Uh, I think that this movie wasn't half bad. Now, was it as good as... I want it to be. I mean, I would have done some things. I mean, I would have done a lot of things with the DCU differently that would have. I mean, the DCU have had, where I'm running it right now would probably be it's still decent shape at least. But I mean, I mean, I would have done some things a little bit differently in the movie. I wouldn't have leaned so hard into the uh, the you know global warming thing. But I mean, yeah, they went but heavy still, on that. But still, I mean, it, it worked for the context of the movie. You know what I mean? I, I still I still think it was a dumb situation for Black Manta to. Black Mantis to, to put the world in because it's like what's what's the use of running a world where you've destroyed it? <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah. I mean, yeah, great. You're you're leader of the world that now can't sustain itself for very long, so you're not going to be a leader for very long. That kind of that kind of thing in movies has always kind of annoyed me. But uh, yeah, I don't think it was half bad. There were some good things to it, and uh, you know, let's talk about one of them right now. And, and this I know will go very well with Utex. There is a certain horror element that. James Wan brought to these oh, yeah. Aquaman films that was fantastic that really impacted the way the visuals of both the first Aquaman film and this. Uh, what do you think of the horror influence that James Wan brought to these two films? Well, James Wan, obviously I'm a fan being the, being a Saul cultist as I am. I mean, he literally that came from his mind. So, of course, I'm going to be a fan of the guy. But the the horror elements within this movie is especially are pretty hardcore. I mean, you, like you see King Kodax, you know, or Kordax, I, I can't remember how you pronounce the name of the villain of the, or the ultimate villain of the film here. He's a legitimate scary guy. You know, when you see him in his crustacean form, it's like, it's like it's a mix of the, the ghost from the third Lord of the Rings movie and like the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise kind of blended together and it works really well. It looks good, you know, and to speak to another horror element here at the end of the film, when once black man, has Aquaman's kid and like, he's on the altar. You like, I went with my youngest. She truly believed that baby was going to be sacrificed. You know, like it, he made it believable, obviously, you know, this wasn't a rated R film. They're not going to kill a baby in a DC movie. They're not going to mm -hmm. do something like that. Killing babies but, is a hard sell in almost any movie. <laughs> it's like, even, right, even if it's a movie right. like Cannibal Holocaust, where you know that's all you're going to see is death and blood spit back. Right. That's the one thing that will really turn people's stomachs. You're like, oh, no, not the baby. Right. That's, you know, because I was sitting there watching her watch the, the, the those parts in the movie, and I'm like, she was really afraid of this. And I was like, that's very effective. I, you know, I like how they presented that. And, you know, I mean, James Wan, he's a horror legend. He's he's a modern horror, you know, legend, icon, whatever you want to throw on it, of the 2000s for just the contributions that he's given. And, 
you know, I think he brought it very well with these Aquaman movies. It's definitely influenced with the, the whole trench and the creatures and, you know, that influence is for sure there. I mean, and it works well. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the best things that they could that they could have done with this. Because if you think about it, it's like usually when we see, especially in animated form, we saw Aquaman back in like the, uh, the Justice League of America days back in the 70s and 80s when we were watching. It's like you would go underwater and it was it looked it looked more like SpongeBob SquarePants than it did like what the act, ocean actually looked like. I mean, it was like right. you know, clear blue water, and he's he, you know, it, it, it was a very I mean, of course, cartoonish way of, of seeing things. But if you ever watched like you know submarine footage of being very deep in the ocean, it's not a light, fluffy place where SpongeBob lives in the fucking muffler of the sea or whatever pineapple of the sea. It's not that. It's a very desolate, very scary place. A lot of very scary things living in it. So, very dark. Yeah. So you. Ha- so I think James Wan and this this touch of horror that he put in it was actually it was kind of the perfect way to show this environment. I mean, you know, uh, deep sea anglers and like some of the crustaceans and shit you find to deeper depths, they're they're kind of intimidating looking. They don't look very they don't look very, they don't look like pets. They're not something you can reach out and pet and it will eat food from your hand and that kind of shit like a deer. It's like these are dangerous things that live in a dangerous place and they are dangerous because they have to be. So having that horror sensibility of James Wan not only helped with some of those visuals, but just the atmosphere as a whole, because even at, even Atlantis, it's not I mean it is it looks very nice and livable and, and it looks like the kind of place to be, but it still does have this dark tone to it. it it's not entirely yeah. this place. that looks overly welcoming, even to even early in the movie where you're seeing like the people throwing, you know, the boxes back and forth. It looks like they're just going through their daily lives. It looks like a place that's a little intimidating. So I, yeah. I, I, so his horror background, I think was great for the visuals of what they were trying to do to build this world. Yeah. I, Perfect guy to direct these two movies. I almost wish they would have given him the helm for you know the whole thing after Zack Snyder took off, but just because I, I think he that, probably had. I thought, a, I thought that at one point too. That could have been a good move for DC. I think he could have had some interesting views. I mean, because let's face it, the, the biggest difference between DC and Marvel has been the tone. It's like Marvel's been a little yeah, more airy, a yeah. little more light. Now, granted, that's going to be changing a little bit as we move forward. They're going to be exper- they're going to be experimenting with the R stuff. Deadpool is one thing, but you're also going to have Blade eventually at some point in the next hundred years. You're going to see Blade. That's going to be R. Our grandkids will our grandkids will love that movie. It'll be yeah. tremendous. Role. Yeah, they'll be there opening night. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, and they've already kind of messed with it. Like Werewolf by Night, I thought was an, I thought was a good way to get into like the horror aspect of the Marvel universe. So so yeah, I mean, so why not give a horror guy a chance to run this thing? Because all their movies have been kind of dark. You know, you know, all of the Batman stuff was very dark. Batman gets Batman kills kids. Oh, yeah. I don't know why you don't know that. Superman was a very dark tone film. Even Wonder Woman, the, the both the Wonder Woman films had a different hue about them. The first one definitely because it took place in World War One and everything was kind of grayscale anyway. But like even Wonder Woman eighty four had a very dark signature to all of it. There there wasn't a whole lot of happiness in that movie. You know what I mean? So. So yeah, that's something well, the, that DC you had, and I think he would have been an interesting person to kind of shepherd this on forward. Besides Aquaman, I always I've always thought the perfect DC story that um, James Wan should do would be the Green Lantern in Blackest Night, and basically what Blackest Night is, it's the Black Lantern Corps, and it's a zombie core of the, it, it's a zombie version of the Green Lanterns, because you know in the DC world there's green, orange, yellow, blue. The entire entire color spectrum has their own lantern core. Well, the black lanterns, they're the death. They they can they will find a dead body in the grave and you know bring them out and give them superpowers and stuff. And within that storyline, you had a black lantern, Batman, Superman, and all these different versions. And I've always thought James Wan with his horror sensibilities, he's James Wan is one of those guys that he. He can do a mainstream movie while still having his his horror credibility is still there. He's not like a Rob Zombie, which is more grindhousey, out on the fringe. He can he can work within the system, but he has an element of darkness to it. I mean, look at his whole Conjuring franchise, and I'm not talking about the later ones, but like the first two Conjuring movies. Both of those are tremendous films. Like I said, the the the, the Saw franchise. The sinister films, the Insidious, you know, he's done a lot of good stuff. And 
I, you know, I'd like to see him get more, but hey, you know, he's hopefully he makes Saw eleven. That's all I'm hoping for. But you know, we'll see. We'll see if that works out. I mean, wasn't there a bump in the road about Saw eleven at some or some point in the last couple of weeks? No, it's not watching. As far as I watch, somebody done a video about it. I forget who. Last I heard, everything it was being written and everything was a go. If there's if there's been any uh, any um, issues, it's new. It's news to me, but you know maybe I missed something. I have no idea. But uh, you know, let's move on now and talk about the cast. And I really, really, really was hoping Jeremy would be here for this one because I knew this would be the point where he'd flip out about Amber Heard and talk about everything that had nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she was barely in this movie though. I'll. I will give them credit. They did everything they could to cut around her. I will give Warner Brothers that much credit. I will say that. Well, I mean, for for whatever that's worth, I mean, the cast of the movie, not too greatly unchanged from the first cast, from the cast of the first film, but I mean, what did you think of the cast and who stood out to you the most? Um, for me, it's a mixed bag. I'm not a huge Jason Momoa guy. Jason Momoa is another one of those actors. He's kind of like Vin Diesel or The Rock. He kind of plays himself and everything. And with this being the last Snyderverse movie, they kind of just, it seems like they're like, all right, you know what, Momoa, you just go do your thing. Just go be you. And it seems like there was less Arthur Curry Aquaman and more Jason Momoa. more A little more comedy than I would, would have liked out of him, but whatever. The two stars of this movie for me are Patrick Wilson and... Uh, black man, uh, J, J, uh, I can't say his name either. I'm sorry. I can never Kevin say. Scott. I can never. I don't think I'm saying it quite right either. It's 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 a right. Yahya Abdul Mateen. Yeah, Mateen. I'm just gonna call him Black Mana because otherwise I'm gonna butcher it. So Black Mana, Black Mana, and Patrick Wilson and as you know, our motion master, they carried this film on the you know on the redemption side. You've got Orm. He's he still kind of hates his brother, but for the you know good of the family, he you know it's the it's the I mean we this movie gets a lot of comparison to Thor and Loki for good reason because it's basically the DC version of it. I get it, but I thought it worked well. I mean Patrick Wilson is a hell of an actor. He he's one of the probably better modern day actors out there from ever I mean from Watchmen to the conjuring stuff to everything this guy's done. It is just he's a really good dude. And then the guy that plays Black Man, he's so he's so driven in hate for what, you know, for Aquaman killing his daddy. He's willing to burn down the whole world or drown the whole world. You know, there's a conviction there. And especially when, whenever you see him possessed and how he's acting and the aggression he shows in his face whenever, you know, he's possessed and whatever. I thought both of them really, really carried this movie for me. Other than that, it, it's, you know, Amber Heard, I could care less. I think we got maybe five to ten minutes of her in the entire movie. Momoa was, eh, whatever. But, yeah, for those two, that's where I'd go with. Yeah, I, like I said, the cast mostly is the same cast that was from, <clears throat> the, uh, from the first movie. But, I mean, We'll talk about Amber Heard specifically here in a minute, but I mean, really, it's like the the whole buddy cop thing, the dynamic between these two. I thought at one point I thought it was good, at other points I thought it was annoying. <laughs> I mean, because because like you said, it does get annoying at times. Yeah. There, there's kind of only so long where you can go with like Jason Momoa being the the yeah bro whatever guy, or well going up against Patrick Wilson being kind of the not antagonistic, but he obviously doesn't want to be there. He still feels like he's more worthy, so on, so on. His kind of angst-ridden, you know, unwilling yeah. participant in all this. For a while, I was like, I want to see this thing evolve. Because James Wan had talked about the relationship between these two being a lot like the relationship between Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy in 48 Hours. And I'm like, this couldn't be okay. farther from the truth. Because their, their relationship in that movie kind of evolved over the course of the film. This one never yeah. really did until the very end when it was too late to really matter. And I'm already wrapped up in the, the completion of the story anyway. So I, I yeah. so while it was good for a while, I don't think I saw the evolution from that relationship that I wanted when I wanted to see it. I mean, there was little moments like when he eats the bug, things like that, that were kind of funny. And that was like, oh, was like, see, I was, hated that. That was one of those that moments where it was crazy. kind of a step. That was one of those moments where it was kind of a step in that direction. But there wasn't enough of those individual steps here and there, like in between the action spots. 
for that to really work out very well for me. Uh, but once again, I mean, bad guy. Superheroes are one of those they're bad guys. Oh, yeah. Great bad guy. I awesome. mean, I'm doing, dude, awesome. that's serious. Every time I see, I see, uh, yeah, I always say it wrong. Yeah, yeah, Abdul Mateen in a movie, he's good. This guy is an up and comer. Oh, he, he's was great. Movie, he was in that movie Ambulance with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, which I've heard was decent, but not great. But it's like Bruckheimer, and I think a lot of people just kind of hate Bruckheimer anymore for whatever reasons they have. So, but I mean, it's very, I, it, it's very, it's very cliche to hate him these days. Yeah, I, I love him on screen. I mean, he's when he had the whole green eye thing going and he was, you know, fucking tripping out and doing all that shit. And like these moments where he's interacting with, with hate, with, with uh, not Hades, uh, with uh, ne Necris. I, yeah. I, I think it's, I, I think he really carries a lot of this movie in places where probably uh, where Aquaman couldn't. You know what I mean? Where 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 Arthur Curry couldn't, where Jason Momoa couldn't. So he, yeah. he's a great bad guy. I, mean, I cannot say how how much I cannot put in words how much I loved him. It was also look Dolph Lundgren. I mean, he's kind of perfect for this role. He he's got the little bit of the accent. He's still got the build. I mean, he still looks kind yeah. of like the Ivan Drago badass. And I, it's like I don't know why, but it's like when I saw him on screen, I was like, yeah, this this guy fits this movie. He's he's really really. Now, on the subject of Amber Heard, I mean, come on. <laughs> it's like, let, let's be honest. Look, here, as, as far as the I'm not in enough of the movie bullshit, I, I think that was just her whatever. That was her bitching and crying because she knew she was losing that case. I get the whole Johnny yeah. Depp thing. She knew, she knew that there was no way for that to end well for her. I think that's all it was. The reality is I thought the part that she played in this movie worked great for the movie. Having her injured for most of the movie, getting injured by by Black Manta, and then that being a big point of one of the things that motivates Aquaman to do what he does, you know, it kind of like it gives it gives his character that different emotional angle. You know what I mean? Having his wife, the mother of his child, be so severely yeah. injured by this bad guy. I mean, because I mean, because look, Pepper Botts was in danger how many times, and Iron Man had to come to aid, come to her aid. Get, oh, yeah. with James Foster, and, and it's not a typical damsel in distress because she too has roughly equal. She's not as strong as Aquaman, but she has a lot of his abilities. Very similar so, powers. Yeah. It, so it's not like she's just a damn. It's not like Lois Lane, who has always been a character for the most part that's kind of gotten on my nerves, especially especially in the DCEU. They, they didn't do they didn't do Lois Lane at all. Margot Kidder was a way better Lois Lane. The way that they put that character together back in the seventies was way better. Amy but, Adams. Uh, I she never really had a chance. I, I, I would have liked to have seen her done differently. I agree. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I thought the cast was solid. And Amber Heard, I mean, look, she was in the movie as much as she needed to be. Look, this movie wasn't about her anyway. <laughs> this movie, I mean, even before the trial, before all that stuff kind of took over, kind of overran, overshadowed what the movie was going to be, period. It's like, yeah. even back then, James Wan was like, this was really about the relationship between the two brothers. This is going to be those two doing the bulk of the work. So she wasn't going to be the driving factor behind this movie anyway. I honestly feel like she got the a total amount of screen time that she probably would have gotten either way. I mean, I, 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 don't, under, I don't understand what the, the complaint was by the people who were on her side that she was taken out of the movie or they cut her down. I mean, she's in, a, she's, she's in the most important part of the movie, the third act. She did a good part of the first act. There's really only the middle, like, 30 minutes of the movie where she's absent. So she's there for most of the important shit that goes on in this movie. So what are you mad about? That she's not in every scene or that she's not important enough? Because she was important. She was there. She was there for all the biggest shit that happened. I, I, I don't, She I don't makes really a huge show. save at the end of the movie. I mean, yeah. without her at the end, they don't win. See, they should, they should have killed her in this movie. At the beginning of the film, whenever Black Mana attacks the house, Amber Heard should have died. That I thought James Gunn, with his horror background, you know, with this whole going after the blood and everything else. Yeah, it's it's one thing to put a baby in danger. And 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 I get that was their framing device to get them to the end of the movie. But I thought within all of that, you still could have done the baby being kidnapped thing. Amber Heard should have died. Because of all the contract disputes, all of the I'm not in the movie enough. See, that's what I, uh, whenever, um, I, I, forget, I think they did reshoots one or two times in this film, I can't remember. But I, there was a lot of rumors swirling around that Amber Heard was going to die. And that's why the reshoots were happening. 
and they were just going to cut out all of her crap and then reshoot bits and, you know, piece the film together. But I would have killed her in this movie. I would have, I would have done it, given Aquaman that even more motivation to find Manta and, you know, the lost King and everything else. But, you know, it didn't happen. And Hey, we got enough of her in this movie to, you know, it's whatever. But a lot of those Amber Heard crab babies were, unless the whole movie was about her, it wouldn't have been good enough. So hell with them. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know that she necessarily needed to die in the movie. Uh, that to me, it would have. have it wouldn't have bothered me. I think that would have given that would have given that certainly would have given him the emotional weight in that moment if he'd have stood well, up. Well, it's the end. And it's not like you're getting. Like it's not like you're getting a, a a Aquaman three here. So let's up the stakes and let's go out on, on a high well, point. Not I think oh, at the time at the time they were filming this, I think was before Gun and Saffron took over. So there probably was at the time. There was probably well, some idea that the DCEU would continue in some fashion. You just didn't really know how. Well, see, that's the thing, because with that whole turnover of Warner Brothers and everything else, because at one point, like you said earlier, Af um, Affleck had filmed a cameo. Then Keaton had filmed a cameo, which wouldn't have made sense for either of them, because by the end of The Flash, George Clooney is your new Batman in this universe. He's the one that walks out at the end of the movie. So you would have needed a third cameo to be filmed. At this point in time, Warner Brothers didn't you know, know where they were going. And it kind of shows in this movie because it is the end. But like I said, I would have, I would have killed her off. I would have upped the stakes and I would have made everything else mean that much more. But that's just a creative choice. I would have gone with give her a good death on the way out. Yeah. It certainly would have given more emotional weight, but at the same time, like you said, she comes right. to the end of the movie, makes the big save. They all kind of live yeah. happily ever after. And I think that's, that was probably a better ending because of the as it turned out because of the fact that this would be the final movie for the dcu you you kind of leave things on a happier note you don't really want to leave things in the note of a big death so i would say let them oh, all live mean, ever after you mean aquaman having his i am iron man moment at the, at the end of the dcu <laughs> uh, I, I was like i was watching that and i was like could you honestly it's like, tell me you're trying to be Marvel without telling me you're trying to be Marvel. Well, it's just, it's not even like he's wearing, Iron Man wears a mask. He needs to announce who he is. Everybody's already seen your face. You're, you're not hiding from anybody, dude. It's how many guys with lo you know long hair and beards are out there riding seahorses? Is there many <laughs> of them? I don't know, but whatever. It, yeah, it was dumb. I, I don't know, but... Uh... But before I start bitching too much about that stuff, I mean, that's probably a good opportunity to transition to the plot. Uh, what did you think of the plot of the film? I mean, did it work out for you, or was there some things that you would have done differently? Well, I, I think the plot works. The plot... This film, like I said, knowing going into it, this is not going anywhere, so it kind of doesn't matter. It's kind of a moot point. The plot works well enough. It's, oh, well, there's the Lost Kingdom, and it's trying to, you know, Black Mana trying to get revenge. That's basically it, Black Mana revenge. Like, that's, you know, wrap it up in a nutshell, one sentence. It works for what it is. It's acted well. But there's two plot points for me I would have changed. Like I've already mentioned one, the Amber Heard being killed, and that stupid fucking bug shit. That drove me insane. That's what I was going on about a little too much Jason Momoa in this thing. Because that, that didn't fit. That's not an Arthur Curry Aquaman thing. That's a Jason Momoa thing. That's one scene I would have changed. But plot wise, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a cop, you know, movie, you know, like you said, um, whatever, it, you know, it's, it's fine. It's nothing special, but it works. It's a get. The plot got us to where we needed to go well enough, and hey, you know, it's we got to see some cool shit along the way. I do think they went a little more Indiana Jones this time than the first one, though, especially with the whole desert stuff and everything else. But you know, it was fine, nothing special. But you know, the Snyderverse was dead either way, so it didn't really matter. Yeah, I, I didn't mind the plot too much. One, I mean, yeah, the whole yeah. global warming whatever stuff. I mean, it, it went heavy-handed with the preaching. It was, 
crap. It was obviously them trying to be a little preachy, but it wasn't nearly as obnoxious as the wow. first Avatar. <laughs> it's like the first Avatar was like every other line of dialogue was eat bugs, fuckers, eat lettuce, you're destroying the environment, cow parts. Wow. It was like every other line was some bullshit like that. Whereas this yeah. movie was like, yeah, the whole climate change thing is part of the plot, but it's not, it, we're not going to cause, it, it's going to be something so extreme that it's like, it's nothing that anything can actually happen in real life. I mean, this guy's finding some kind of fuel source that has been hidden by the Atlanteans for God knows how long, for decades upon decades, yeah. apparently, and, and doing something extreme. So it's not just like he's using diesel powered engines and like, ha ha, in 200 years, I'm going to drive these around and ruin the environment. He's like, I'm doing it all like right now. I'm doing something extreme. I'm, I'm, I'm burning all this stuff to ruin the whole earth over the course of the next couple of days. That that it, it was it was almost like a James Bond villain kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that a Bond yeah. villain would have done. It was something a little bit ludicrous, which made it a little bit more palatable because I was like, it's not really like this. It's not it's not like you know I sprayed some hairspray in the air and you know five feet of ozone layer died somewhere. It wasn't it wasn't like that. So it was it was a bit cartoonish. It was a bit extreme, which made it more plausible to me and didn't make it nearly as annoying. Um, yeah. The idea of the idea of you know rejoining with Orn, Aquaman rejoining with Orn and, and trying to work on the same side was interesting. I almost kind of wish that Orn would have taken like a heel turn at the end, like you would you like you could have found out that he was the one that was behind it all along, and that would have been a little fun. I think if we had gotten a Aquaman three, that would have probably happened. But considering it was wrapping up, they just you know whatever. I don't know. I mean, I. I think they want Orn to be the good guy in the end. So, I mean, if we'd have gotten three, four, five movies out of this, I think Orn probably would have stayed. He would have stayed something like Loki. Like, you never really know about him, but he always ends up doing the right thing. That kind of thing. But, you know, I, I mean, as far as the rest of it was concerned, I mean, making it a personal vendetta between uh, between Black Manta and Aquaman, I, like, it's kind of typical comic book stuff. But, again, it's in, it's in the presentation. I thought that was done pretty well. Uh, again, you've got yeah. Jason Momoa, who kind of who kind of perfectly encapsulates what they were trying to do with Aquaman in, in this iteration of him, and uh, Abdul Mateen, who is just a great bad guy, great bad guy. I they were, also they were two very different kinds of characters. Usually, you see two very stoic characters fighting one another. You, you see stoic Batman fighting stoic, you know, whoever, or they're they're all very serious. Now you have the very serious bad guy against the always joking and farting around Jason Momoa, it, it, it's almost like Joker and Batman reverse. Usually it's Batman who's the one who's really yeah. serious, and Joker's the one who's always out for a laugh while he's killing 300 people. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. This time it was a little bit reversed. But uh, yeah, I, I, thought the, I thought the imbalance between the good guy and the bad guy was really cool. I think that made it a lot more funner to watch, don't you? Yeah, well, I mean, it's always fun to see. I mean, like you said, we're used to... Batman not cracking a smile and, you know, being depressed, dark and gloomy. As much as that, like I said, I, I like the flip, but I think Momoa took it a little too far with this one. I think, like I said, I think they kind of unloosened the reins a little bit on him and, you know, let him play with it. Kind of like a, you saw the, the last Fast and Furious movie, right? Mm -hmm. That Momoa was in. Oh yeah, Jason Momoa is the only watchable part of that entire movie. <laughs> that like, which I do agree. Um, he had a very similar performance in that to me, in that joking kind of way, and he was more surfer bro than he was King of the Ocean. And I would have liked to have seen a little more King of the Ocean. I, Orm to me was my favorite hero in this, and but I don't know, I'm. I guess drawn to more that style of character, but it was fun to see a flip reverse of, you know, stereotype of hero to villain. So, and like I said, black man, it cannot be praised enough. I know that he's probably not coming back in the DC in the future, but I would love to see Matei, whatever his name is playing black man again. Cause he did really, really good. So I thought he was awesome. Yeah. I, I, I struggle to think of what they plan on doing with this new DCEU because they're like some people are coming back and most aren't. Who like, knows? I, I mean, are we? Are we? Are no, we the only that, people coming back are the ones that that James Gunn worked on. Everybody else doesn't matter. That's the point. Well, I mean, I, I think that the idea is that Gal Gadot is going to be back. 
I think the I mean, obvi- I mean, See, I they, say, they I've heard rumors both ways. Well, for, the way I've heard it is that they didn't like the script for the new Wonder Woman thing that for what would have been Wonder Woman three that was written by by Patty Jenkins because it didn't fit into their future for the DC universe. So it wasn't that they didn't right. want, want her either one of them to come back. It's like they didn't like the script and the way it was going to work in their story. That did not say to me or to anybody else whether they did not want Gal Gadot or Patty Jenkins to return. It just said that script didn't work for the for the direction we're going. So write me a new script that fits into what we're doing and we'll talk. So, but I mean, obviously we're getting a new Superman. I really thought they would work something out with Henry Cavill, but that's not that's come to pass now. We're getting a new Superman. Uh, Henry, Batman, poor Henry Cavill, he's been screwed around so much. I'm telling you, Henry Cavill is Wolverine. You want to pull a big time fucking coup? <laughs> hey, that shot of the guy in the white tux. I'm not saying that's Henry Cavill, but that's I'm saying that's definitely not Hugh Jackman's Wolverine sitting there. I'm saying that's a very Wolverine. That very well could be a Henry Cavill or somebody else sitting there as that version of Wolverine. And if that is, that's the biggest screw you to Warner Brothers and DC ever. Like, oh yeah, you didn't want to me- make me your you know, head character, Kevin Feige did. So screw you guys. I'm out of here. So we'll see. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a huge coup. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to make him the comic book star that DC couldn't. But hey, uh, if if Hugh Jackman's not going to go on, why not? Somebody's going to be Wolverine, right? So why not Kevin? And, and if you think about it, who who at that this stage at that stage of their career could possibly take over for Hugh Jackman? If you think right. about it, there's a whole lot of similarities between Hugh Jackman and well, and, uh, and, and and Henry Cavill. So and Henry Cavill's got a good and the answer is not the guy Jackman that played Daniel. Harry Potter either. All, all still, these people I that want think, Daniel, I still think Daniel Radcliffe. Uh, I still think he could. I uh, I could not take that guy seriously as a wolf. I mean, I know he fits better comic book wise, like height and stuff, but I could not take Harry Potter serious as Wolverine. I'm sorry, that's just not going to happen. I'll, I'll find the movie. No, that I'll find the one movie where he plays an undercover FBI agent, where he's like he's like potty mouth. I'm sorry, that like really hardcore. It, it's it's not the best movie. It's a little low budget. It was one of the things that he was trying. It was one of the movies he did when he was trying to kind of escape the Harry Potter, you know, doldrums. Where he was like, I, uh, I can do it. I can do things other than the Boy Wizard. So guys, here, watch me do this. But uh, I mean, it wasn't a bad movie. I can see him do. I could have seen him playing James Bond too. I mean. Think I'm fucking crazy. Oh, I, no. He, no, he could, no, no, like, no. I could have seen him playing Bond. I could have seen him do it. He's, he's got the accent. You're a mutant, Harry. Ching. He's got <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're, the memes make themselves. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, but I mean, ultimately, do you think that was a good, this was a solid ending to the DCEU or, or did they kind of uh, <sighs> get the bed? <laughs> to, to use the phrase that's on everybody's tongue right now. It would have been a better ending if the ending of the Snyderverse, DCEU, is Ocean Master eating a bug. I'm not happy with this. I'm not okay with this. I get it. It was funny 30 minutes ago whenever you know Aquaman tricked him into doing it once. But I would have liked that they could have ended on a cool shot of Aquaman on the seahorse or something else. They should have had a better final shot than Ocean Master eating a bug, but the you know post credit scene to the side, the film itself, I thought it ended well. It, like I said, I would have liked to have seen some more stakes, maybe some more characters die, considering this is the end. But you know what, Shazam two sucked. I did not like Blue Beetle. The Flash was hot garbage. So considering out of the four options that we had left within the DCU proper, I'll take it. It, it's, it was a success. And, in those terms, so I was, you know, I was happy with the film. So. Yeah, I, overall, I thought, anyways, I thought it was the kind of happy ending that only celluloid really delivers. I mean, it's it's it was a happy ending you would have seen from a movie in the thirties and forties, which is probably the yeah. best thing you could do under the circumstances. Because I mean, because if I'm if I'm if I'm done in Saffron, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want this movie to end on too big of a downer. Because even though it is not part of what we're doing moving forward the audience is going to have a taste in their mouth from this movie before they see anything that we do going forward. We don't want to leave a bad taste in their mouth. So let's everybody. So let's give Aquaman to the happy, happily ever after. 
everybody lives. They're back. They're rebuilding the lighthouse. Everybody's great. Orn's out here on his own now. He's been freed. And, and you know, Mara and, and Arthur are raising their kid. And everything's good. Everything's happy. The seven seas are great again. And that's all good. And let's end it like that because we want people to walk out with a positive feeling because in a couple of years, there's a Superman movie coming out that we really, really need people to like. And more importantly, there's a Superman movie coming out that we really, really need people to spend money on. <laughs> and the last thing we want to do is have to, is have to suffer from a lot of bad movie hangover from three years ago. Like if this movie sucked or didn't end the way they wanted it to, the last thing we want to do is we want to have, we don't want to have that bad feeling sitting in people's heads when they're going to see this next movie coming out that is going to be the legitimate start of our new DCU. So let's give them the happy ending. Everybody, the good guys win, the bad guys lose. Uh, special effects, everybody walks out of there pretty happy. The baby lives and survives. And they teach the baby how to make the fish jump around and stuff like that. I so sure wanted good them to good kill feeling. that kid in that movie. Good, good oh, that would have been so cool. Yeah, leave, leave this movie with nothing but good feelings so that helps us in a couple of years when Superman legacy or just superman i guess it's now called when superman comes out and they're still gonna hopefully have some of those residual good feelings to go see the movie and maybe they'll like it more maybe if we miss in a couple scenes or a couple of plot points it won't be so glaring because that's been the biggest problem with dc is they'll, they'll come out with a shazam which is really good a lot of people like it and then they come out with some crap tax and shit like black adam which i actually thought was kind of fun but it wasn't yeah good. and then it's like they I come out with enjoy. Wonder Woman, which was a great movie. It made a billion dollars. People are like, oh, shit, this is the kind of stuff we need to compete with Marvel. And then they come out with Wonder Woman 84, which, while I thought it was a fun enough movie, wasn't as good. Did not have the same feeling. Yeah. Uh, and then they kept, and then, you know, Shazam, and then come out with Shazam 2, which was not very well done. I mean, I, I still thought it was fun. Not nearly as good as the first one. You know, and, and then, you know, Aquaman comes out. You have Aquaman, and then whatever dumpster fire of a movie. And then, and then you have Flash, which wasn't a bad movie, in my opinion. But it took 27 years for you to make a movie that was okay. When after 27 years, you better make me something that wins every Oscar that is given out. Like everything down to like the best janitor award <laughs> go to the flash. Yeah. So, it, so, so developmental hell. And you gave me a pretty average movie and I like blue beetle. I thought it was a good movie. I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Now was it, was it Marvel level great when they were in their prime? No. Was it the best thing that DC's done? But it wasn't I, anything special, though. It was just run-of-the-mill superhero. Well, I mean, it was just... That's kind of what this is. You know. Yeah, but, I mean, it's like I said, you know, at the beginning of this. You had uh, Blue Beetle, Flash, Shazam 2, and Aquaman 2. Films that meant nothing, so nobody went to go see them. That's why they didn't make a billion dollars. That's why this movie barely made $400 million. They barely made double their budget and it was just it was there was no stakes so nobody cared everybody had already knew hey the you know wait two more years until something matters again but then, and you know i think you know stuff like that helps contribute to that superhero fatigue because they were just kind of average films i mean like this film this wasn't a great movie this movie doesn't do anything Oh my God! This scene right here—it doesn't have any of those. It's good, but it's just there's like ten more of kind of the same caliber. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, Marvel made a couple of films that weren't really important to the overall MCU that still made a billion dollars because yeah. the movies were well done. It's like Iron Man three does not really do a whole lot to push the the, the larger DC or MCU down the road, but I mean yeah, that's it, a very self-contained. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. They, it's like they're they're movies, yeah. they're good movies in and of themselves. But they don't really have a lot to do with the larger universe. Same thing with uh, no, no, not the first Spider Man, but uh, it's like uh, Thor. The first Thor, really, none of the Thor movies had anything to do with the larger universe. But it's like not really, with, with, the, with the exception of like you know some name drops and stuff like that or, or things like that. You know, they, they first mention I think the Infinity Stones in one of the in one of the Thor movies, but. Uh, but it's like, but none of the Thor movies did a whole lot to push the larger MCU down the road, and they still made a, bit, a bajillion dollars. So it's like, so it, it's I don't think it's superhero fatigue. I think it's bad movie fatigue, and I think the I think the proof of that is in right now is in Marvel. I mean, Marvel all the way through the end of the Infinity Saga, billion dollars, billion dollars, two billion dollars, billion dollars, billion dollars. I mean, it's like without without even trying, we're making a billion dollars. 
huge opening weekends, huge box office, and, and critically, they were thought of, uh. they were thought of very well amongst critics and fans. But then you get to, but then you get to the point after Phase Four, the creativity starts to suffer for a lot of reasons we've talked about: JPEG overloading the market with you know the MCU stuff. It, it, it was not superhero fatigue; it was bad product fatigue. It's like you can like going to McDonald's every day for lunch, get you a little burger, fries, and a drink, and that's what you do until they serve you three or four bad hamburgers, and you're like, uh, I don't know if I like McDonald's anymore. That's when you start going to Burger King. <laughs> so, but well, so it's, it's really bad quality fatigue and not necessarily superhero fatigue. And let's face it, because uh, uh, Chung Chi is is a very is one of the best things they've done since Phase Four started. That movie made a billion dollars. So, so if you put out a banger, people will go see it. But it, and it's like there were so many things that they picked that they picked on the DC movies for, like the Martha scene, things like that. And I won't go too much into this because we'll have our retrospective coming up here in a few weeks. But it's like the Martha right, scene, yeah. the uh, the lack of cohesive direction, the lack of cohesive direction in the at the executive level of, of Warner Brothers. And DC. That's what I was going to say. The problem. The biggest <laughs> the biggest problem DC had was management. It wasn't yeah. it wasn't bad movie fatigue. It was oh, people didn't like the early screening, so let's throw out the baby with the bathwater, completely redo what we're doing to the point where we have no plan for in six months to only throw all this out to do something else again at that. Yeah, time. and that was a so, big part of it is that the is at the yeah. executive level, like the the brass up at uh, Warner Brothers in DC, they're the ones who are really screwing things up. So yeah. oh, yeah. it, it, it's it's hard to. It's hard to disseminate and to really put in words how important all that shit really was. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's not comic book fatigue. It's bad movie fatigue. There's been a lot of great franchises that have kind of fast and furious. <laughs> I mean, like, hey. I've said it a hundred times. When Paul Walker died, that franchise should have died. They've been putting out schlock uh, every I, since. And the only reason that keeps making money is because they keep marketing the fuck out of it. And because there are a bunch of mindless zombies out there that want to go out there and watch Vin Diesel fly a car. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> it's like, There's, I, there are two franchises, Fast and Furious and the Transformer franchise. They are probably the most dedicated fan base to those IPs because those almost guaranteed those movies are going to suck, but they are going to make more than enough money to pump out another one. Because especially overseas, those movies do really well. In the Asian market, they both of those movies kill. So yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, what, I think that's a, why they make yeah. money. If you go look at those franchises, the domestic yeah. box office oh, yeah. in the U.S. and Canada, yeah, they're like shit. They're, they're not even top ten, right. fifteen. But you go over to Asia, Japan, China, they're all they're making a billion dollars. Yeah. Oh there. yeah. But oh yeah. But yeah, but the 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 comic book movies don't really have that problem because they're going out everywhere. So if you're releasing a Marvel movie and a DC movie within a week of each other, they're going to all the same markets. And the Marvel movie is making a billion dollars and the DC movie is making four or five hundred million. There's a reason for that. Because they're going back to see the Marvel movie. They're not going back to the <laughs> DC movie. They're going to see it once and they're like, oh, okay, that's pretty good. But I'm not going to watch again until it, until it hits max. But it's like this one, oh yeah, I'll go back to watch this, this Avengers movie. I'll go back to watch this Iron Man movie again. Because it's better. I'll pay for their ticket to go watch this movie twice. But yeah, that, that's right. the biggest thing. Like, was it a good ending? Yeah, it was fair. Like I said, it needed to leave you with a good taste in your mouth. It needed to leave you on a happy note, happy ending. It kind, of, it kind of was a way to say thanks for sticking with, especially the hardcore DC fans. Thanks for sticking with us through the ups and downs, through this roller coaster ride that has been the DCEU. Uh, right. you know, here's a here's a palate cleanser. I, I think that's the right term. Here's a palate cleanser of a movie. It's going to give you some good action, some cool visuals. It's going to give you the happy ending. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of years with Superman. And, and hopefully, well, hopefully you guys will be ready to to give us another chance. And you won't you'll remember the DCEU, but you won't let it taint your judgment of the new DCEU. You know what I mean? Well, this was a you know, I think this movie did that well because it was a fun watch, even in the tense moments. Once this movie starts, it just goes, buddy. It is a roller coaster ride. It, there's no lulls. Like the the one time in the middle where it slows down is when a uh, um, you know Aquaman has rescued Orm and they meet back up with uh, Nicole Kidman, their mama there, and they're like, you know, she's basically like telling them to be good and work together. Once you get past that moment, it is all yeah, right there, which is a great scene by the way because you can tell, you know, Orm he knows 
you know, I mean, he, he obviously loves and respects his mother, cares for the crown, his family, his, you know, Atlantis, his people. But he doesn't really take Aquaman serious at that point. And, you know, you can kind of see, is he going to turn bad? Will he you know, stick to his mother's word? And which plays into the whole scene where, you know, he grabs the, uh, grabs the, uh, trident later on and trident. later on in the film is, uh, you know, the dark trident. Thank you. You know, it ties directly into that scene. But once you get past that scene, it's a roller coaster ride, buddy. And there is one action figure. They made Aquaman in the orange. They made Aquaman in the black. They made a black man, a figure. They made a, uh, a, a figure of the King uh, Kodak or Kordax, whatever. The lobster guy with one claw. How did they not make a toy of that guy? <laughs> that guy was freaking hilarious in this movie. Yeah, I loved him in this role. I, I don't know who played him, but he was great. I have to shout him out specifically because where the comedy didn't work with Jason Momoa, it worked with the Lobster King. Uh, he's the Brian King, I believe is the character name that he went by, but yeah. absolutely freaking hilarious. So I liked him too. Yeah, that's uh, John Reese davies the one who was in all the, uh, in the, well, not all of them, but he was in the Indiana Jones movies. He was Salam. Oh, was okay. Okay, I didn't know who played him, but yeah, the Brian King was hilarious. I mean, great CGI in this movie. Holy crap, does this movie look good? Like, you, you can see a couple things here and there that look a little, you know, that could be a little polished a little better, but overall, you know, I don't have any complaints about the CGI that they've done in this movie either. Yeah, but uh, let's move on now to a little bit of trivia. And uh, again, I, I don't know if it was because the movie was kind of dead in the water giggity <laughs> pun right. intended <laughs> when it when it came kind of, kind of like flash it was like it, i admit it, it was kind of hard to get too jacked up about seeing it because you know that there's the only payoff you're going to get is in this movie there's no payoff after that but uh a right. little bit of trivia anyway uh, aquaman actually dons the blue stealth suit which i swear to god i had a picture of it for some reason it didn't load uh dons a blue stealth suit in this film which carries the octopus inspired ability to change color this blue suit comes from the 1986 Aquaman comics. They can do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it looked cool. It, it was a cool effect. It was, like I said, I mean, they marketed it. They had action figures just of that, you know, Aquaman and blue, black, whatever. And, you know, it looked, it, it, it was, a. it kind of stood out differently whenever he's, like, standing in the middle of the desert in the all-black suit. That kind of visual kind of clashed a little bit. I thought I, the orange and green would have probably looked better, but. I, I like it. It's, you know, it was cool to see different technology being used. And it's, you know, normally it's just Batman that gets different costumes. This time Aquaman got a costume change. So, you know, that was cool. Yeah. Or a Callum, it's actually Greek for mountain copper. And it's considered to have a traditional copper red color, not like the green color it has in this film. But copper turns green uh, when corroded by water and salt. Which makes up ocean water. That's how uh, ver uh, I'm going to pronounce mispronounce this word. Verdigris is formed. The color of corrosion also hints at how toxic it is. Uh, okay. Like I said, I I am not yeah. too upset at the whole the plot of like him trying to ruin the environment or whatever. I mean, it. I mean, uh, w w without without all the other stuff going on around climate change and all that. I mean. The idea of somebody using this gross smoke to ruin the world, like I said, it's very James Bondy kind of thing. It's some secret island out in the middle of nowhere where someone's trying to pollute the entire planet. It's like that. It worked for it worked for this movie, I think. I, I don't even think that plot point's really needed. I mean, think about it. This whole point of this film was, <coughs> excuse me, Black Mana wanted revenge on Aquaman, right? Let's make that the singular focus of this film. He can still, you can still encounter the lost kingdom and all of that. And instead of that lost kingdom wanting to flood the ocean or flood the world, make their goal. He wants to take over at Ad, just Atlantis. So you simplify it down a little bit. Maybe we can get more black man in here. Maybe a little more of this, a little of that and less green peace, save the world, you know, blah, 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 kind of thing. Considering it's the end of the line, let's trim the fat here. I don't think the whole, you know, ice caps melting bullcrap was needed, but 
they, I guess they had to get their politically correct messaging in here somewhere and preach at you for something. So, you know, they had, they had to fill their quotas. <laughs> you you got to keep the people who are funding you happy. That's, that's, that's a lot of it too. <laughs> like I, I right, want them to loan yeah. me money to make the next movie. So I guess I'm very kiss a little bit of ass in this one. Uh, the film's right. working title was actually Necris, the underwater kingdom in the Aquaman comics and seen in this film. Necros is named yeah. after Necro, which is the Greek word for dead. That looks so dead, cool. I love that. Dead Sea? I do like this image a lot. That image is like that. Could, if that was a poster and it said Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom, I would buy that poster and hang it on the wall. Like, like I, I said, if, that, that's cool. No, I, I wonder if we had gotten that movie, The Trench, which was supposed to be like the horror spinoff of Aquaman. I feel like it would have looked yeah. something like this. Well, that's what I was talking about at the beginning of this. To me, that's like a, a mix of like the Pirates of the Caribbean 2 where the the people on the uh, the people that are mixed into the ship or whatever that are dead, and then you have those ghosts get the ghost army from the third Lord of the Rings film. That to me, if you put those together, that's what you get right there. And it looks awesome. I love that that visual. Like I said, if that's a poster, I'm hanging it up. I like it. I really thought I had a better picture of Nicole Kidman in here, but I guess I don't. Uh, let's see. I'll just go back to my picture here. Right, this one. Uh, despite working as a performer since the early 80s, this film marks Nicole Kidman's first movie sequel in which she appeared in the previous entry. She previously appeared in the sequel, Batman Forever, in 1995, but did not appear in the previous two movies or in the follow-ups. Yeah, in the first, well, not the first three Batman films, but from the Tim Burton ones on, you had a different main girl. You had, uh, she was in Forever. Uh, uh, yeah, there. It, uh, it seems like every time Batman got a new lover or something in his new Batman film, so they wanted to recast somebody. I think Vicky Vale, let's see, wasn't Vicky Vale mentioned in Batman Returns? Because she's obviously not in the movie. I yeah, can't she was kind of, yeah, there's that scene where they're kind of talking about Oh, it. she like, goes to that island. Yeah. What's that island well, that she goes to? The Court of Maltese, but she uh Court of Maltese. Yeah. yeah, she asked like you know that because Kat because Michelle Pfeiffer is asking him about his other relationship. He goes, Yeah, she's a photo journalist yeah. and she you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It just explains that she's yeah. not around anymore, that their relationship didn't work out. It's kind of right. like they got it. They didn't really mention her by name necessarily. But yeah, it is kind of interesting that she uh that she's never done a sequel. I mean, she's only been in five thousand fucking movies. Oh but um I can't say I've seen a lot. I've seen Vanilla Sky, Days of Thunder, um, the Batman movie. I may have seen four or five Nicole Kidman films. I haven't seen a lot. So, I mean, I'm not a huge fan either way. But you know, I have seen I have seen BMX Bandits. Have you ever seen that? I've never even heard of that. This was Nicole Kidman when she was probably 15, 16. Really? Okay. It's on, uh, I think it's on Prime. It's on one of their streamers. I forget which one. I'll have to find it and let you know. But it's like she's probably 16 years old and she's just like some BMX kid. She's riding around with a couple of guys in Australia and they're, and they're like riding <laughs> their BMX bikes around and they find these walkie talkies because you know that was advanced technology back in 1983. They find these walkie right. they find these walkie talkies that belong to some criminal who was going to use them to rob a bank and then this criminal right. obviously they get mixed up with this criminal who wants to get his walkie talkies back and it's this whole thing about the criminals it, it's more of an action comedy kind of thing it's, it's kind of a goofy movie but yeah, the, kind you, the kind you only could have gotten from the early 80s so it's like they're riding their BMX bikes around. It's like Perth or something like that, or so, so whatever whatever city they live in Australia, trying to get away from these guys. We're trying to chase them, and then you got like the main bad guy who's kind of running the whole thing. You have those two bumbling idiots that he's always trying to send to go get these kids and get their, their radios back. It's it, it's a fun movie to watch. It's 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 fun the way that like the Goonies is kind of fun and goofy or something like that. It's oh, kind of yeah. like that. But if I, if I can find it, I'll send it to you. It's it's an hour and a half, maybe an hour and forty five. It's it's a fun watch if you're bored. I mean, you can sit there and watch it with your daughters or something like that. It's it's a goofy kind of movie, but it's got a right. very young, like sixteen year old Nicole Kidman in it. 
But it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen oh. like eyes wide shut and all kinds of stuff like that. So, uh, Stepford Wives. Yeah, eyes wide shut. Yeah. The Stepford Wives yeah. is actually not a bad movie. That it's kind of a comedy. Oh wait, I did see like her in comedy. that. Um, uh, that the remake of Bewitched, the TV show where she yeah. was in that. I have seen that one as well. That yeah. one was, I, you know. Not as good as the TV show, but it was still fun. Most definitely not. Most definitely not. Let's see. Uh, in the film, Kordak created the Orakalium Trident that carried supernatural powers. In the comics, the Orakalium Trident was created by Devil Ray, a former associate of Black Manta, and is highly radioactive and lethal to humans and Atlanteans. So they, they redid it a little bit for the movie, but I thought it worked out well. Well, yeah, and a lot, a couple of those characters that you just mentioned, they're like D and E list DC Comics characters that you're probably never going to see prominently used in the film. That oftentimes they get like you know things pulled from them and merged to you know to another character. That happens quite a bit. It's you know it. I like I liked Kordax in this film. I like the look of him once he became all you know all messed up and how he looked, you know, kind of like a monster out of, you know, he came out of Lord of the Rings or something. I really felt a Lord of the Rings uh, ins inspiration on this movie a lot, visuals and storytelling wise, and both being Warner Brothers. I wonder if that was intentional. I'm not quite sure, but uh, yeah, Cordax was a cool villain. That's, I saw that action figure as well for sale. It looks pretty sweet. I like it. It was, that I wish we got more of him in this movie. I wish that they had released him earlier and we could have seen more fighting with him. By the time we get to him in this movie, he's in it for like three minutes at the very end of the last of the fight. But you know, they give screen time to everybody else. Yeah, you know, to the point of something you said earlier, Black Manta is actually known for having killed the infant Arthur Curry Jr. in the comics in the story arc yeah. Death of a Prince. He actually comes close to murdering Aquaman and Mira's child in this film, but they actually didn't do it on screen. <laughs> didn't even think about it. Yeah, it's a shame. Maybe they can, you know, do a... Obviously, Warner Brothers is not going to go that hardcore and do a rated R. We killed a baby in our superhero movie thing, but if somebody like Eli Roth ever makes a uh, superhero film, that's probably where it'll happen. It ain't going to happen under this kind of management, so unfortunately not. You know, we haven't really talked about the post credit scene yet, uh, it, or the final scene. Oh, right? uh, Orm's final scene of the film has him wearing a shirt with the cartoon with the cartoon character shark Jabberjaw from the Jabberjaw 1976 cartoon. Jabberjaw and Aquaman actually had a crossover comic just a few years ago in 2018. Really? Well, I... I knew Jabberjaw was owned by Hanna Barbera, which is a Warner Brothers product. All of those, you know, like Wacky Races and all of those spinoffs of that world, they're all owned by the same company. So I knew, I knew that, but I didn't realize that they did a crossover comic book. I'll have to look that one up. That'd be interesting. I'm sure it's nonsensical, but you know, I'd still like to see it. So one, of the things, one of the things I've really liked about the way that they've shot both these movies is the underwater effects. They're all pretty free wild. Oh, yeah. uh, to create the various underwater worlds and creatures, one and the creative uh, the creatives transitioned away from blue screen methods used in the first film, and instead used new technology called Eyeline Studio, which saw the actors in circular booths surrounded by 136 cameras, which producer Rob Cohen said changed the creative and practical methods of shooting this film. Really, that's kind of wild. I'm actually like like making up. It movie. makes sense because some of these shots, they are odd. There is an odd definition to some of the facial features. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know if, if these pictures really do them any justice. But there is a weird kind of definition and shading to the underwater shots that I didn't really, I couldn't really put my finger on. You know what I mean? To me, the to me the most distracting thing is in this movie was. Watching the hair constantly floating above their heads. That's the one thing that, that drove me nuts watching this. You know, well, like when you're, Arthur's if, just if sitting you have on the long throne. hair and you're in water, I mean, whatever. <laughs> right. Oh, I know it's 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 a stupid thing, and it's not even a complaint. It's more of just a that bugged me a little bit. But you know, 
I visually between like how they're making the, these kind of films and like how they make like the Mandalorian show where like they're in these entire green screen rooms and all this different kind of technology and they're I, it's crazy what they can do these days. I mean, go back to uh, Batman v Superman, where we first see Aquaman, and that shot where he's under the water. You know, we see him for like two seconds, and then I think it's uh, Justice League where we see um, Amber Heard Mira's character do like that water bubble around them, and they talk within the water bubble. And to see where they got to in this movie. The, the technology is worlds apart, and that's within a, what a ten year time span. So I mean, they came leaps and bounds from where they were. It's crazy. Yeah, that's all the uh, the trivia I seem to have for this one. Like I said, I guess they didn't want to put too much uh, too much of the behind the scenes stuff out there. They were like, let's just get this movie out there so we can move on to whatever gun this after we're doing. <laughs> Well, yeah, we'll, unfortunately, we'll, we'll keep Momoa happy because eventually we want him to come back and play Lobo. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and just move. Uh, yeah, move that. that's. I got a feeling that's probably happening, and I hope it does because Lobo is a great character. He's you know he's gonna be fun to watch on screen. Yeah, without going too much into it, don't don't blow your wad now because we have a retrospective coming up here in a, in a couple weeks. Right. What do you see the future of the DC the DCU looking like? Now? Yeah. Now that we're done with the Snyderverse, we're moving on to this new thing. What do you see it look yeah. like? I don't want to see a DC version of Marvel. And I'm kind of afraid that's what James Gunn is going to do. I understand Marvel is the, the formula, but that doesn't mean DC has to follow them. I know James Gunn has already laid out like a five or ten year plan. I want Superman to be good. I want the next movie to be good. Build this thing up one at a time. Don't lay all your stuff out and just, we have to do this, have to do this, have to do this. I, and I'll get into more of this when we do our, you know, break it down because I have things I'm holding back, but I just want a good universe. I want to see a full bat family. I want to see versions of these characters that stay around that, don't get crapped on and Warner brothers just, like I said, throws the baby out with the bathwater. It's okay to have a negative review. Warner brothers just saying, you don't have to just change because some idiot on the internet says, Oh, I didn't like your movie and craps on it. So I just want to see cohesion and storytelling. Cause I'm tired of DC having to restart over five years. You know, I hate, as Jeremy has stated, you know, being a DC fan is kind of like being a fan of the Cleveland Browns. You're constantly rebuilding. You never get anywhere. You start, then the head coach has to leave. And then you got to rebuild the whole offensive coordinator system and you get new special teams or whatever. Let's get something, stick with it, and ride it out until it works. So get it together, God. Yeah, I, at this point, I just, I'm just like, just take it one movie at a time. Give me, I, yeah, I'm not exactly. concerning myself with Batman Brave the Bold. I'm not concerning myself with Creature Commandos. I, I, those aren't even on my radar right now. On my, my, yeah. my concern is Superman. That's it. The no other movies get on Superman good. until that movie comes out. Concentrate on Superman and make it good. I, I don't, know, I don't want them to follow Marvel's formula as much as I would like to see them follow follow Marvel's template. I, I said this a long time ago that I thought they were. I thought they were trying to get back in the game with one swing with Marvel when they decided to run right to Batman versus Superman and then right to a Justice League movie. I was like, why don't you take your time, build these characters, have them do what Marvel did. You don't have to follow their formula, but follow their template. Do the Iron Man, do a couple of characters, and then do like the Avengers mashup thing to where you start to kind of set up the big thing. That that Because it was after the Avengers that you first see Thanos. You first get this illusion that there's a bigger thing driving this whole bigger universe. There's a one big bad guy that eventually we're going to get to after we've built all of our good guys up into this awesome kick-ass force. And then we ended up getting that in Endgame and in, uh, and in uh, uh, Infinity War, and it worked out great. They tried to skip over all that and run right to the mashup, and I was like, you haven't even given me a Wonder Woman movie at that point. Nobody knows who the fuck uh, – the, the, not Colossus. What do we call him Colossus? Uh, Cyborg. Cyborg. Nobody knew who the fuck Cyborg was. People barely knew who Ray Fisher was. So you're getting a very unproven character outside the comic books. 
unproven character outside the comic books and a relatively unknown actor at the time. He's done stuff since then, but it's you're expecting them that to be a big selling point. You've only given me hints of Galaxy Dale as Wonder Woman at this point. It's like you, I mean, the the hell they got for for casting Ben Affleck in the first place, largely largely undeserved. I mean, I, I love Ben Affleck in the role. It, it's like the only the only movie you had to build all this off of was Superman. And, then, and like the Batman versus Superman wasn't a terrible idea, but it really should have been Superman 2, Batman versus Superman. Make that the sequel. Because they never got around to giving Superman a proper sequel. It's like, we had two Iron Man movies before we got to Avengers. No, you had taken Batman your time was... to open this universe up. You should have done that. You should have showed me different parts of this universe. Give me hints of the Green Lantern Corps. You don't have to give me Green Lantern. But like, drop a little thing like Marvel likes to do. Like when you're surfing the internet and you're reading about whatever, there's a little thing on the side that says, man with claws, you know, tears up bar in Canada. We know. That's the end joke that we know. But it's like strange green light appears over Wisconsin or some stupid shit like that. that Just gives you the hint. You know, show the little angles of your universe and then hit me with the mashup. They ran right to the mashup and tried to get back in the game with one swing, and they just weren't ready. I, I wasn't, I wasn't into what these characters are in your universe before you went for the big swing, and that's one of the reasons I think they missed. Use that template: one well, movie, one movie, one movie, and then, a, and then a mashup thing, a bigger thing that kind of sets the stage for, if not Steppenwolf, certainly like uh, uh, not Armageddon. What the hell's his name? The, their version of Thanos. What is it? I forget. Uh, Dark Side. Dark, Dark Side. Yeah. Yeah, I want to call it Armageddon for a minute. I don't know why I want to call it Armageddon. But yeah, it's like set, <laughs> set up dark side. Don't don't just run right to it and hope that you're going to catch up with Marvel. It's like you it's Marvel, look, Marvel is running a marathon, not a sprint. You gave Marvel a 10-year yeah. head start and thought that you were going to sprint and catch up to them. It's like, no, they're they're too far ahead of you. Just run your race. Run your race. That's all you had to do. Well, you didn't have to try to keep up with them. Just do your movie. You have the two best comic book characters ever. I mean, yes, Iron Man's great now, but he was kind of an obscure character until Robert Downey Jr. took took the stage. <laughs> I mean, oh, a very much. Are, a, lot, a lot of people don't remember that, but a lot of people are kind of like, you're really starting with Iron Man, who was kind of a, a good character, but not a great one. And then they get to Captain America. They didn't really touch Hulk until they were pretty, they were balls deep in the MCU. And the first couple of Hulk movies, well, the first Hulk movie was kind of, wasn't even part of the MCU. It wasn't all that good. The second one kind of was, kind what? of wasn't. <laughs> I mean, it was, but whatever. No, it's you, like you're talking about the the one with Edward Norton, right? The one with Edward Norton is technically in the MCU. Yeah, because Iron Man pops up at the end of yes. it, where he talks but, to the. Yeah. But they've rarely ever, other than having that character, they've never really touched on anything that happened in that movie until they get to Blonsky in She Hulk, and apparently yeah. we're going to be getting the leader in uh, the new. Captain America, Captain America, and, and whatever the hell. Yeah, if that movie ever comes out too, it's, it'll, that it'll thing's being out. reshot again. That, that's fine. As long as they, I'll just get it right. I don't care how many reshoots. If you have to delay it a year, fine. Get it right. I am 100% fine with you delaying a movie for a year. I will wait for a good movie. I don't want you to rush me a bad one. Because that's where you well, end up getting in trouble. That's where Disney got themselves in trouble with the MCU. Is they were trying to rush out. It's like they went from making one or two projects a year to dumping like every other week we were getting something on Disney Plus or some other movie. It was like they were just set they weren't giving enough time to this stuff. And I think that's what ended up happening with DC is Walter Hamada and some of these guys, they were like, I really want to make that money on my bonus check for getting this out before January before December 31st. So that we so let's just run. Let's hurry up. Let's get this out there. And it's like, how about it how about it's good? It's like it's great to have it out well, there so you can have it on your byline, on your on your profit line for this year. But it's like you're going to make so much more money if you push it off six months, a couple of reshoots, a couple of you know, write in a couple of new scenes, tighten that movie up and make it better. I Why wouldn't you do that? You'll make so much more money in the long run. And I will elaborate on this here in a couple of weeks whenever we do our retrospective of the DCEU, but. There's certain comic books in the DC world that are, I'll use baseball terms, that are a grand slam. You've got The Dark Knight Returns. You've got Kingdom Come. You've got certain comic books that are huge things. They started the DCEU. They had Superman and then went right into The Dark Knight Returns, which 
Batman v Superman is my favorite Batman movie and favorite DC movie of all time. Love it. But you probably did it too early because you have to, I mean, think in the comics world, you had like 80 years of Batman and Superman existing within the comics before that happened. So there was a lineage and a history. They started with it. The one thing that worries me about the gun version of the DCU is that he's doing the same thing but with Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come, that story has a like 90-year-old Superman. You know, it's older versions of all of the characters. They're doing a reverse Kingdom Come and starting with this story. That's why Superman has that S on his chest. It's very certain to that comic book. And I'm afraid that they're just repeating the Snyder mistakes, but this time it's James Gunn version. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong because I don't want to see another restart. I don't think the superhero genre can handle another failed universe because it might just kill it. But I hope I'm wrong. And I can't wait to elaborate more about this here in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned, folks. Yeah, here in a couple of weeks, Tex and I, probably Jeremy, will be here. Certainly American Werewolf New Jersey is going to come in. He is the, oh, yeah. him, like like Tex, he is the the big time apologist for the DCEU. <laughs> he loves the Snyderverse. We will have them here to defend it. Uh, me and Jeremy will hopefully do yeah. the more, uh, the more uh, objective points of view. There were some things I liked <laughs> about it overall. There were some things I didn't like about it overall. It was mostly... Mostly it was execution here and there, and, and them just trying to rush to greatness. So I was like, you can't, like I said, you can't. Well, yeah, you can't take two steps and then and be great. Sometimes you got to build. Just because, and, and I'll say this without giving everything away, I do love the Snyderverse overall, but I have a lot of issues. I mean, even with the movies that I love, I have problems. There's a good bit of the Snyderverse that. I could not care less about it, and I will get into that in a couple of weeks as well, too. But it's not all sunshine and puppy dogs, you know what I mean? But, you know, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, but uh, thanks to all of that. Well, before I get out of here, I mean, give me your, your final thoughts on Aquaman uh, 2023, the last movie in the Snyderverse. Give me your final thoughts. Yeah, Aquaman 2. Fun watch, uh, turn your brain off, enjoy kind of popcorn film. A little too much Jason Momoa, not enough Aquaman, but Patrick Wilson and Black Man are more than make up for it. Their performances are fantastic. Visuals are great. Um, great. It's a roller coaster of a movie. Once you start, boom, we're going, buddy. And it's one that you can have fun with. You know, you, you kind of, it's kind of relaxing to know in your brain, hey, I don't have to watch five more movies after this. I'm finally to the end of this line. Whether it's good or bad, you're at the end of the line. And, you know, this is something that I could see myself rewatching in the future, you know, just by itself. And um, I would recommend it to, you know, anybody that wants to see it, except for the stupid bug eating crap. That's, <laughs> I still hate that. So for all the people that say the Martha scene is bad, this scene is worse. Like I, I hate it. It's it's it's. I get it. It's funny. He ate a bug. Okay, we don't need it twice, James Gunn. That's the all my biggest criticism of this film. But you know, I still say go check it out. It's a fun watch. Yeah, I agree. It's a good movie. It's it's self-contained. They didn't put it. They didn't give it a big emphasis in the larger universe. Because at this point, why bother? Uh, you know, let it just happen in Atlantis. It, it's a good story. Look. The, the characters are good. Jason Momoa, I mean, for this iteration of the character, I think worked out very well. Uh, again, a great villain. I mean, Abdul Mateen really makes this movie great. Uh, he's fantastic, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, honestly, I hope they find a place for him in the DC in the DC moving forward. Because that's that's one of the actors I that I would hate to lose. I mean, it, look, look, flip it and make him a hero. Like, help make him cyborg. I could see him as John Stewart Green Lantern. I could see him as the black version of Green Lantern. He, I mean, because he's a, I believe John Stewart is a Marine. I think he could bring that seriousness of that military role, and he could be really good in it. I'd like to see him get a shot, anyways. Yeah, but uh, yeah, just watch it. It's, it's a, it's a good movie. It's self-contained. It's a, it's a decent enough send off to the DCEU to the Snyderverse. Uh, you know, say what you will about Amber Heard. I mean, you don't have to watch her scenes that closely. <laughs> she's not in it much. She's, she's really not, not. She's not in the middle part of the movie anyway. 
the, the oh. meat of the movie, like why not her? I mean, she shows up at the end. She throws some punches and beats some people, some some uh, some henchmen up. That's all she needed to do. She saved her kid. Yay! Mom saved the kid. Yeah. Good job. But uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not a bad movie overall. I think it's I think it's fun. Uh, go watch it. It's it's free now on Max. If you have a subscription to HBO Max, you can go watch it there. Uh, thanks to uh, Van Edwards for showing up today. Uh, to, he says, uh, "Wish you guys would convert the show to a downloadable podcast type of thing, so I can listen to work." We actually kind of have. I uh, I've got a Podbean account that said, you can go to Podbean and look and find it there, or it, it's it. I think from Podbean it sends it out to a couple other places. Uh, I've only got one review up there right now, and that's our Cocaine Bear review because anything that runs over two hours, if I try to con- if I try to convert the audio, it's too big for Podbean to handle. So that's one of the reasons I've been trying to keep things to below two hours lately is because it makes it easier for me to get the audio and move it over to Podbean. I haven't been worrying about it too much lately. I've been more concerned with getting videos up on Rumble because I have to transfer them over to Rumble, which basically means I have to download them on my computer and then download, upload them to Rumble and then move over like you know the description and stuff like that. So, But I've been more concerned with that because I want to try to grow our profile on Rumble a bit more so I can start going live over there. But, uh, but yes, they, right now, if, if you guys look, it's actually where they put it. It is right. I just scrolled down enough. It is right here. That's our link to the to our Podbean. It does not say the harsh truth. It actually is just my last name and my first name. So go find us at that oh, link. Uh, I'll I'll try to remember to put it in the description as well. I'll try to put it there permanently. But uh, yeah. So if you want just a downloadable audio version of what we do uh, for the shorter stuff, I'll, I'll probably end up putting this one on there. Uh, for the shorter stuff, I will probably start putting it over on there too, so you can download and listen to it if you're not at YouTube right away. But uh, yeah, thanks to me for bringing that up. I'm working on it. I know that uh, I know that Connor th- does you know the horny goat stuff. He does the audio stuff. I haven't had a chance to like reach out to him and be like, hey, "What's the easiest way to do it?" I just right now, this is how I'm doing. It. I haven't so, talked to him forever. I, well, we're friends on Facebook and stuff, so we go back and forth every now and again. Uh. I haven't had a chance to pick his brain about how he does it. But uh, you know, like I said, I've been more interested, intent to just trying to like keep constant you know content going up. You know, maintaining our my personal standards for not putting up shitty videos, which sometimes I can't help it. But uh, <laughs> I'm only so good at this right. overall, and uh, and trying to and trying to grow YouTube a little bit more. But uh, yeah, we're we're on the way. I mean, we, look, we just recently hit 500, like what four months ago. Now we're on the verge of six. Yeah. So I mean, we're we're hitting steady growth. I thought oh, once we hit 500, that YouTube would kick us into the algorithm right. a little bit more, and we start to get a few more eyes. It's kind of happening like that. So I mean, spread the word. I hate to be this YouTuber, but I mean, like and subscribe, spread, you know, share us around. It helps Please, us out a lot. Yeah. One of these days, I'd like to become a big famous YouTuber that can do this for a living and put out content every day or every other day or something like that. It's never probably going to happen, um, but I mean, I still dream like it's going to, you know? If I could get paid and make a living just watching horror movies and talking about them, that's basically like my dream job. So please make that happen, people. I, am, I, would, I would content every day. I'll do whatever. Make that happen. <laughs> yeah, but uh, thanks to my my good friend, the shape of Lone Star State, my man Tex, where can I find you, my friend? Uh, here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, assuming I'm not laid up in the bed and can't even sit up straight. But you know, I'm, I am on the mend, starting to feel better with a bad back. You know how these these things don't heal quickly. I've been in pain this entire time, but I'll tough it out. So, you know, um, and I, I'm not going to recommend an older film. There's some really Interesting horror films coming out this weekend. Um, Immaculate, it's a Immaculate Conception kind of film with starring Sydney Sweeney is out. Oh, uh, what were the other ones that I sent in? Uh, there's there's two or three horror films that are coming out this weekend in theaters that are worth going to. Oh, oh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. It's a three-day event on the 26th, the 27th, and the 28th. If you want to go check out uh, Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. So just keep an eye on your local box office for, and obviously Ghostbusters after like uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire we'll be talking about. But there's some pretty good stuff coming out that, uh, you know, maybe you get out to the theater with the family or a date night or something. So go go check that out. Yeah, next week will be all Ghostbusters all the time. I thought I still had my thumbnail up for when I was going to do a review of Ghostbusters Afterlife, but I, I cannot find it out for some reason. But yes, next week will be all Ghostbusters. We'll be doing Ghostbusters Afterlife on Tuesday, and then we'll be doing the new film Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, which is going to be hitting theaters. Technically, it's in theaters where I live tonight. Uh, obviously, I'm streaming tonight, so I won't be able to see it, and I 
don't think I'll be able to go tomorrow. Tomorrow, This weekend's going to be a busy one. But uh, I will definitely be able to see it before Thursday. And then uh, we'll be breaking that one down on Thursday. It, it's getting some mixed reviews, which has got me a little disappointed because I really liked Afterlife. I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was a great way to get back into that universe. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll, so next week is going to be all Ghostbusters all week. Come and join us for that. Uh, that is all for now. Thanks to all of you for coming to hang out. We very much appreciate it. We will see you guys next time. Until then, adios. I don't know why I like it. Playing. I mean, the good news is, it's like th- like this scene right here. I was telling myself, I was like, is he whispering in her ear, please don't shit in my pillow? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, he's like, I know do you think that- work out between you and Johnny, and we've had our moments, so please don't shit on my pillow. <laughs> do you think they do you think Warner Brothers jumped the shark making this movie? That's my biggest question. I think Warner, I think the DCU jumped the shark probably three or four movies ago. But again, I don't <laughs> I was waiting on review to make that fun and stupid. <laughs> <laughs>